video about evaporation and vapor pressure. So we've learned about evaporation already and evaporation and vaporization are basically the same word. It means, you know, having your liquid have enough energy in the form of heat usually where some of the molecules at the top surface can gain that energy and escape. Um, and so we know this is evaporation or vaporization. And we know that that sometimes doesn't require a lot of heat, meaning your cup on the nightstand without a heat source underneath it, that those water molecules inside can escape from the surface of the liquid and evaporate, also known as vaporization. Obviously, the more heat we put under, the more evaporation and more vaporization we have. So we're going to be focusing now on our new topic, which is vapor pressure. And you probably can piece together the definition of vapor and pressure, and voila, you know what vapor pressure is, but we're going to walk through that. So what's important to know is that vapor pressure can occur as long as you have vapor. So let's first look at this scenario here. I've got an Erlenmeyer flask, and it's closed off right now. And my liquid inside my Erlenmeyer flask um, is evaporating, seen here. Right here's some molecules of water that gain enough energy, and they're leaving the surface. This is evaporation. And at first, it appears that we have a lot more evaporation happening. Well, eventually, these molecules now will realize that the container has been sealed off, and so they'll have nowhere else to go but to collide and hit each other and come back together, which is called condensation, and fall back down into the liquid. And eventually, the rate at which molecules are leaving the surface and then recombining and condensing back into a liquid, that rate equals out. And we reach what's called an equilibrium, when the rate of evaporation equals the rate at which condensation is happening. So in turn, the liquid level eventually kind of reaches a halt. Um, it stays about the same because you're having those molecules return back at the le liquid level as soon as they are leaving as well. What's happening here is I'm building up something known as a vapor pressure. It's the pressure that's exerted by the gas molecules that are forming. And I can even have a vapor pressure if I remove the top of this container. It's just that it's going to be hard for me to measure it. So, you know, I could say that I have a vapor pressure, but it's escaping into the system. So here's a real formal definition of vapor pressure. It's the pressure of the vapor present at equilibrium with its liquid. So seen here, this is an, a great way to measure it because you've capped off uh, the system. Um, but again, vapor pressure can occur even if you don't have um, a lid on that system. It's just going to escape into the system or into the environment. Uh, so in order for this water here to evaporate, we learned in our last video that intermolecular forces need to be broken. So this is important to remember is that we need a lot of energy to overcome those intermolecular forces. So a lot of this is going to sound very familiar uh, because it ties into our last couple of videos. Okay? Uh, so some new things are that if a substance has a high vapor pressure, it's called, it's said to be very volatile. And what volatile means is that it evaporates very easily. I know a lot of times we think of the word volatile as meaning, you know, out of control. Um, and in science, it's like the molecules are kind of out of control. They start evaporating. They have enough energy to evaporate. So think of all that energy being volatile. So an example of some liquids maybe that you've come into contact with is acetone, found in nail polish removers a lot of time. Um, it, you know, it's very volatile. You leave the cap of acetone off and and it will evaporate very quickly, um, which must mean what? Well, if things are evaporating very easily, it means that their intermolecular forces must not be that strong because they can break apart and leave the surface so that therefore the energy needed to do that must not be a lot. That's an important connection to make. You want to make sure you write that down. Okay? So, what about the reverse? Well, liquids with intermolecular forces that are large or strong are going to require a lot of energy. 
And so therefore, they're gonna have lower vapor pressures. They're not going to evaporate very quickly. It's gonna take a lot longer for them to evaporate, which means having a lower vapor pressure. Okay, remember, you can also affect all of, or change um, all of this if you start to increase temperature. So let's talk about how temperature affects vapor pressure. Well, if you want to get a lot of vapor, then you can also change the temperature. So here's another way we can alter things. Higher temperature means more evaporation happening, which means an increase in vapor pressure. So we can actually um, change different variables to affect our vapor pressure. Okay, so let's go back and remember about intermolecular forces. I'm going to remind you of a, of a few things here. Um, we've talked about strong intermolecular forces and weak intermolecular forces on a previous video. And so you see my little buff man here with strong and my poor little weak man there. So here are some things that hopefully you remember. And um, we talked about these intermolecular forces, a dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, and London dispersion forces. Remember, hydrogen bonding is a type of dipole-dipole, but it is a very strong type of dipole-dipole, whereas some of the other dipoles are not as strong. Okay? Um, this is probably a good time to stop and review your notes on these three in order to move on with the video um, if you don't remember this. Okay? Uh, so let's take a look at an example problem. What if uh, I give you these two molecules? I see you have water at a liquid phase and CH3OH as a liquid. CH3OH is known as methanol. Methanol, okay? Um, what's important is to remember your intermolecular forces. So it might be good to take out your notes for these and ask yourself, do I have any of these types of intermolecular forces happening? Uh, well, the easiest thing to do is to think about how your molecule looks like if drawn. So if you notice here, I have a water molecule. And then here's a methanol molecule. Now, up until right now, you probably did not know how to draw methanol. So it's important to draw it and take a look at it. It's carbon with hydrogen centered around it. You always want to put carbon in the center and surround your hydrogens. Okay, and then it's bonded to an oxygen that's bonded to a hydrogen. So this is important to note. You might want to practice writing methanol. It's a good example. Now, now that you know what they look like, you can find 